Hi, Michael. Hi, Charles. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm excited to be kind of pulling the course together and wrapping it up and putting it in a box and sending it out into the world. Yes, me too. It's actually been uh, fun so far. Uh, as we tape this, we are about halfway through, I would say, uh, the first iteration of the course. And uh, Michael kindly agreed to come down to Atlanta uh, to talk to me again uh, so that we could mention a few of the things that we didn't get a chance to cover mm. uh, in the class uh, because we basically just didn't have time. It's not that they weren't interesting, but because this was a survey kind of course, we wanted to make certain that you had uh, the basics and that from there you could go off and, and learn things and really understand uh, why they're interesting. So what we're going to do is just very quickly talk about some of the things that are either sort of new and interesting now or perhaps old that we just didn't have have time to cover, although may still show up on the final exam. Okay. <laughs> and plus, mm -hmm. I believe that everyone now has a really good background for being able to appreciate these things. Right, and I think that's what's important. Remember, the, the main goal of the course was to give people enough of a breadth and just enough depth so that they could then go out in the world and understand why something like deep neural networks is interesting or different or the same uh, as the way we've been thinking about these problems for years. So in fact, maybe that's a, a good one to start with. So. Uh, maybe we can just talk about a couple of the things that we didn't cover. So there's a, two big things that are popular right now, or that a lot of people would have heard of. Buzzwords. In class. Buzzwords, but in a good way. Uh, <laughs> you know, as opposed to just made up stuff. Uh, deep neural networks. Or okay. Deep, or deep sure. learning, which I think is how most people deep learning. Sure. Talk uh -huh. about it. Uh, and big data. So those are two kind of things that are out there right now in 2014 uh, that people talk about. We didn't really get a chance to mention. How would you describe them in 15 seconds? Mm. So big data is the issues that come up when you actually have a tremendous amount of data. So more and more now it's possible to attach sensors to the world and get tremendous amount of information, either web pages or biological data. I've got a little thing that, that measures my steps every day. Mm -hmm. You start to pull this data off over enough people, you can, there's a tremendous resource, but also challenges in actually extracting good information from it. Right, and a lot of those challenges are algorithmic. That when you know we, we talk about things like uh, the curse of dimensionality and, and having to deal with exponentiality, well, when you have big enough data, the truth is, even linear can be slow. Quadratic mm. is unacceptable. Linear is unacceptable. in the amount of data. Yeah, linear right. in the amount of data because you've got so much data coming in. And by the way, you're never going to be able to look at it again because by the time you look at the first set of data, another day has passed, mm. and you've got another several petabytes of data that are coming in. What's really nice about big data, which is worth mentioning, I think without going into too much detail. Yeah, it's only been 15 seconds. So only that's, been 15 seconds, yeah. we've got another three or four, is that <laughs> the data, because we have access to all this data, it's fundamentally changed the way science works. Ooh. So it used to be people talked about, well, experiments and theory, and I'm sure there was something else about you know how science was done, and now they talk <laughs> something about- Something else, the scientific method. Else. Yeah, well, no, but I mean, but now one of the new pillars of science, which which is finally agreed upon by the scientific community, is computation, the ability to do simulation, the ability to look at the data in order to, to uh, validate models in a way that we couldn't do even 15 years ago. Um, and that's really amazing. It's one of the reasons why my guess is most of the people who are looking at this first heard about machine learning. It's one of the reasons mm. why it's so popular, because it's applicable to these big science problems that, uh, that we care about. Okay, what about uh, deep learning? Yeah, so, so deep learning or deep neural nets is in, I think in some ways, it's a, a reboot. Is that a word that we use now? A reboot a is a prequel. Word. No, it's a reboot. No, I'm going to go with reboot. OK, let's go with Of reboot. neural nets. Uh, so back in the 80s, there was this idea that you could train up neural nets with things like backprop. But it was not so clear that you could do better with multiple layers than you could with just a single layer, mm -hmm. even though we know that brains are organized into, into lots and lots of layers. Right. Um, so it kind of fell out of favor for a while. But it's, mm -hmm. it's back. Um, and I think part of it is there's a, there's a new set of techniques that can be used to organize the computation in a way that you can actually get valuable information, signal coming through at each of the different layers of the deep neural net. Right. Does it boil down to a clever representational trick? Or is there more to it than that? I think there's a bunch of different tricks. Right. And one of the reasons we didn't talk about them is we don't really know them. Yeah, and it would take too long. And yes, that was the, no, sorry. And it would take too long for us to learn them. Right, we understand everything. I mean, teach them. With, yeah, to teach them. Teach it them. certainly would take too long because we understand them completely. Okay. Uh, we have deep neural nets. We do, well, maybe. We think we do. I guess Jan thinks we do. Does Jan actually think we do? Is there a biological plausibility? I can't remember. Sure. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, okay, so let's see. What else haven't we, uh, haven't we covered that would be? How about semi-supervised learning? Ooh. This is something that I really wish we could have gotten into the class, and maybe in a later iteration of this, we'll find a way to work. We can put it halfway thing. between supervised and unsupervised. Or we could stick it in unsupervised learning, like we did randomized optimization. Yeah. Kind of fleshes it out a little bit. But yeah. the, anyway, the idea of semi-supervised learning is really cool. Like it's a slightly different problem. 
it has elements of both supervised and unsupervised. Like what? So, so imagine, for example, that you've got, um, I don't know, tons of web pages that have on them information about cities, I don't okay. know what to say. Um, and you label them. You say, you know, this web page has information about this city, and this web page has information about this city. And you, you know, eventually you get tired of doing that because labeling is, is human expensive. Yes. So if you've got, you know, a billion web pages and you only have time to label a million of them, then, you, then there's still a factor of a thousand. Sure, let's yeah, go with that. Um, of uh, pages that you have information on them, but there's no labels. And so I think in the early days, people thought, well, well, since we don't have labels, there's no really valuable information there. The idea of semi-supervised learning is that you can actually extract using unsupervised methods enough structure from the unlabeled data that when combined with the label data, it's like having the power of a lot more labeled data than you actually started with. Yeah, that was a really big deal in the what, late 80s, early 90s in particular. 